uh, where we will discuss uh, challenges facing the Norwegian uh, oil industry in view of the Paris Agreement and uh, the turbulence in the energy market. So we have a very pa uh, competent panel with us today to discuss these issues and uh, we have representatives from both the research community, the oil industry and the financial market. First, I just wanted to set uh, the stage very quickly for this topic. Uh, Norway has a paradoxical relationship with climate policy. On the one hand, Norway wants to contribute to a strong international climate agreement and has a very green profile internationally. Uh, but on the other hand, Norway's oil industry has grown enormously over the past couple of decades. So, some key facts on uh, Norway's economic dependence on the oil industry. Uh, oil's contribu contribution to uh, GDP is now at 20 percent. Uh, direct and indirect jobs related to the oil sector are uh, 300,000 out of uh, 5 million citizens. The petroleum sector's share of total investment is 30 percent. The share of state income is uh, 27 percent and the share of exports is 48%. In the current oil regime, oil policy regime, the Norwegian government takes an active role in terms of sharing the risks as well as the income with the oil industry actors on the Norwegian territory. Extraction and exploration happens mainly in the North Sea and in the Barents Sea, in the North, in the Arctic, and there are two ways that, Nor that Norway's government is actively engaged in sharing risks and income with the oil industry. It's first through the uh, licensing processes, strict rules that limit which areas are open for exploration and drilling. First, and, and there are two types of uh, regulations here. Uh, there are annual licensing processes in the mature areas of the Norwegian sector where the geology is known. And uh, there are much stricter rules to regulate opening up of new areas of, for exploration and drilling. And then the second uh, kind of engagement by the Norwegian government is through the petroleum tax system. Um, the oil industry is levied a 25% ordinary business tax, but on top of that, there is a special tax of 53% which is paid only if the company has a surplus. And basically this is the payment for the right to extract oil on the Norwegian territory. And in order to balance this very high tax rate of 78%, the um, government gives generous tax deductions to balance. And uh, there is a capital depre depreciation repayment for investment uh, over six years. And on top of that, an extra 22% tax deduction for parts of the taxable income. And perhaps most important, there is a cash refund of up to 78% of exploration investment costs to stimulate more actors to engage on the Norwegian territory and uh, to uh, sort of uh, incentivize more activity for exploration. So in total, the oil companies pay 22% of exploration costs themselves and earn 22% of surplus uh, um, of the surplus after tax. So the Norwegian government takes a, a, a big share of the risks and the income uh, in, on the Norwegian territory. So in, in the context of supply side policies, uh, there are two ways that, uh, at least two ways, that the that, uh, Norwegian government could uh, sort of engage in supply side climate policy. First, it's to limit exploration uh, or extraction activities. This means to change the licensing processes. Or we could change the petroleum tax system to take away some of the risk sharing and investment support that is given by the Norwegian government in the current regime. So um, now we will um, discuss these sort of difficult issues and the paradoxical situation for Norway under the Paris, Paris Agreement and with uh, an expanding uh, oil activity. And we have first a uh, researcher, Bordelon from Cicero, who will discuss uh, 
sort of this paradox of how Norway has debated both climate change policies and uh, increased oil activities. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Guri, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, so um, this, this paradox of Norway as simultaneously being uh, among the world's largest oil and gas exporters, which is extremely reliant on oil production, as, as uh, Guri has mentioned, and on the other hand, aiming for this international position as a climate leader, I'm guessing that paradox is not the reason why some would want to, to call Norway, as we heard from the, the, in the previous panel. Uh, that has more to do with, with other parts of uh, Norwegian oil and gas um, uh, regulations. But what I will try to, to do is to give a quick um, historical overview of how um, what we discuss as supply-side regulations has been discussed in, Norwe in the Norwegian political um, discourse. Uh, to try to explain um, this, uh, this, how Norway has tried to manage this paradox and, and uh, in fact how, how um, uh, leading uh, political forces within Norway have been very successful in, in uh, um, large uh, part to decouple the discussion about climate policy and the discussion about oil and gas uh, production. And then uh, also uh, towards the end, look a little bit at how that is is now uh, is, uh, looking to to change a little bit, uh, in part because of of um, uh, the Paris Agreement and and general developments in in climate science and climate policy internationally. Um, so. Um, oil and gas was discovered on the Norwegian continental shelf in the late 1960s. And in fact, um, uh, in the, at the early stages of, Norwegian, of the development of the Norwegian oil and gas industry throughout the 70s and most of the 80s, uh, there was in fact quite a lot of discussion uh, about uh, how to uh, retain political control with the, um, uh, the pace of production, the, the level of investment in the sector, and, to, uh, and the, to keep the production and the level of investment uh, under control. Uh, there were concerns um, uh, that about uh, economic impact, uh, what the economic impact would be of a large inflow of uh, investments uh, in, one, in one particular sector. There were concerns about overheating the economy as a result of, uh, of uh, um, uh, large new uh, revenue streams. There were also concerns about the power that multinational oil companies would hold coming into uh, relatively small and uh, uh, small country with, with no prior experience with oil and gas industry. So all of this led to a number of policy measures, um, especially in the 1970s, to make sure that, uh, that the government captured uh, most of the rent. So this is when the petroleum tax system that Gure talked about was, um, was established, to ensure national participation and ownership in the industry. Uh, and interestingly, also uh, attempts to try to limit the actual production of oil uh, to, uh, to prevent the oil industry from, from becoming too dominant within, within Norway. So uh, a goal was established to limit production to a moderate pace uh, and uh, a specific goal was set that, uh, that annual output should not exceed 90 million tons of oil equivalents uh, for oil and gas combined. Um, but uh, this whole discussion uh, was not connected to climate concerns that were not very well established politically in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, there were some general environmental concerns uh, playing into this uh, discussion, but, but that was more about um, uh, a fear of a, a general uh, increase in, in consumerism and materialism related to, and, uh, to increased wealth and so on, and, and not particularly to, uh, to climate. And then uh, something I would say very remarkable happened towards the end of the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s, and uh, two, where two things happened uh, pretty much simultaneously. And one, the one thing was that climate change became firmly established on the political agenda, and there was uh, cross um, uh, across the political spectrum. There was uh, it, it became you know very clear that there was a deep commitment for Norway to to act as a leader on climate change. 
uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the Norwegian Prime Minister, headed the Brundtland Commission uh, uh, on Sustainable Development and, uh, and so on. Uh, but, but at the same time as this happened, uh, the discussion about limiting the pace of production and investment in the oil and gas sector all but disappeared. Uh, and um, the 90 million uh, tons of uh, oil equivalent of annual production ceiling that had been established uh, a, few, uh, a, a few years earlier was surpassed in 1988 without any real political uh, uh, debate. So the target was, was just uh, left. Uh, and um, uh, production skyrocketed, increased um, almost tri tripled by the year 2000, and investment also uh, started to grow very rapidly uh, without any real discussion. Uh, so uh, w w at the same time we had this, uh, this commitment to climate change being established in the political discussion, uh, and on the other hand, uh, at the same time we had, we had this completely, uh, uh, you know, complete uh, well, I, I shouldn't say deregulation, but, but um, uh, well, there were no more attempts to politically control the active level of activity in the oil and gas sector. Um, and I would highlight two important um, policy innovations that helped achieve this, this decoupling of the climate discussion and the, and the oil and discussion about oil and gas policy. And one was the sovereign wealth fund that was established to, um, uh, into which most of the, or almost all of the government revenue from oil and gas would, uh, would flow. Uh, so that kind of um, alleviated fears of overheating the economy and, uh, and so on. So the, the kind of economic argument for reining in production was, um, was weakened. And the other thing that happened was, of course, the development of the international climate change regime. Uh, with uh, so, uh, with um, a, a um, accounting system that is based on uh, on the demand side uh, of fossil fuels, uh, that is, you know, uh, uh, national uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, and with the flexible mechanisms uh, that allowed for uh, for flexibility in how you meet uh, international climate change commitments. And Norway was very active uh, as a policy entrepreneur in establishing this regime, and in particular the whole idea of, of uh, uh, joint implementation and flexible mechanisms acting together with the United States and the Umbrella Group in, in, uh, in getting this international system uh, established. Um, and this allowed uh, for um, combining then relatively high ambitions on the, in international climate uh, policy with uh, almost no real discussion about the level of, of oil and gas production because targets uh, could always be met by uh, relying on flexible mechanisms. Um, so this is not to say that there were no political controversies relating, uh, uh, relating to oil and gas industry in the 90s and, and 2000s. Uh, there were some heated political discussions about gas-fired power plants in the 90s that actually led to a government resigning because they refused to accept building a gas-fired power plant without requiring CCS, uh, so using the slogan proposed by Miles Allen of, of uh, sequestration from, what, what was it? Uh, immediate sequestration or? Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and they had to resign because they, they couldn't get, um, uh, get the majority um, behind this. Um, uh, but this, of course, related to the domestic use of gas, not to, not to the production and, and export, right? And you also had a lot of discussion about specific areas, especially in the north of Norway, whether to open the Barents Sea for exploration, whether to open the areas outside of the Lofoten Islands that are ex especially important for fisheries for, for exploration. And NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs, have pushed since the early 2000s for establishing petroleum-free zones in specific areas on the Norwegian continental shelf that would be a no-go zones for, for oil and gas exploration. But um, mostly they didn't succeed in, in framing this as a climate issue. So it was uh, mostly framed as, uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, potential problems for, for uh, fisheries that are important, in, especially in northern Norway, and, uh, and exposing fragile ecosystems to, to the risks of, of oil and gas production. Um, so, what we've seen uh, in effect is that for the first 20 or so years of Norwegian oil and gas activity, we had quite a lot of discussion about how to 
uh, how to limit production, but no discussion about climate policy. And then for the next 20 years, we had quite a lot of discussion about climate policy, but really no discussion about limiting uh, the, uh, the production of oil and gas. Um, now, however, over the last few years, we have seen, um, I think, the beginnings of a change in which um, policy discussions around climate change and, and oil and gas uh, activity are increasingly being linked. And um, uh, uh, I think um, increasing discussion both about the licensing system that Guri mentioned and also about the, uh, the tax system uh, is, is getting harder and harder to, to avoid in a sense. Um, and this has to do, of course, with the fact that the international climate system doesn't look uh, like what Norway helped establish with the with the Kyoto Protocol in the uh, in the, in the 90s, the the whole role of uh, flexible mechanisms uh, is more uncertain. The whole um, the, the Paris Agreement uh, takes a, a nation, more nationally oriented and bottom up uh, approach that um, that places more emphasis on what each country you know actually delivers um, and. Um, uh, and the other thing is the whole uh, discussion about the uh, the carbon budget that kind of you know makes makes these links unavoidable in a way. Um, with the fall in the oil price uh, that has been recently, the industry in Norway has of course experienced uh, some major problems. There have been significant uh, layoffs and and uh, reduced investment activity, and uh, one could foresee that this leads the policy discussion in, in two different directions. Either it could lead to you know, an increase in support for the oil industry with increased exploration and investment to keep employment high, kind of doubling down on, on, uh, on the oil and gas uh, sector. Or it could also lead to a stronger realization that Norway needs to do more to diversify and needs to, to manage the, the transition away from oil and gas. And of course, it's difficult to, to know how this, uh, how this will play out, but, but my feeling is that because of the increasing link between climate and oil in the political discourse, there are some signs that the latter, uh, the latter version is, is gaining traction. So I'd say we live in interesting times for discussing Norwegian uh, oil and gas industry. Thanks so much for that, Ord. Now we will... Uh uh, proceed and hear from Arne Eich, which is a leading advisor in the Corporate Sustainable Sustainability Unit in Statoil. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for coming. It's great to be, be here. Um, I was not here yesterday because I was in Paris at the IEA workshop discussing the role of state-owned enterprises in the low-carbon energy transition. So. Um, that, that was interesting. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be interesting here today. Uh, a few words about Startoil uh, in the beginning. So we are 66% owned by the Norwegian government, but we are listed at, uh, at, the, um, at the stock exchange in Oslo and in New York. So in that sense, we are uh, uh, operating as a normal private company, uh, having to take care of our shareholders uh, like, like other companies have to do. So. So, sometimes some question on, about whether your uh, Norwegian uh, oil and gas company does directed by the Norwegian government or, or not. That's why I'm, I'm making that point. 20,000 employees uh, operating in uh, around, or we have employees in around 35 countries, producing uh, around 1.9 million barrels of oil equivalents per day. 60% of this is in Norway. We have uh, a separate business area on renewables and new energy solutions. So I'll get back to that uh, a bit uh, later. So I just uh, first of all, and I know you discuss, have discussed a lot on oil and gas companies, the climate advocacy, uh, the climate strategy, the energy forecast and that's great and I hope we can have a discussion on that afterwards as well. So the first thing I'd like to say that we as a company we don't question the climate science. Uh, if we have some employees 
questioning the climate science, go out doing that, we say this is not company policies. We don't question the climate science. We try to act upon it. Can, I'm sure it will be discussion whether we do enough, but we try to act upon uh, climate science. We fully support the Paris Agreement, so no doubt about that. Uh, we do something called the energy perspectives. That's our energy outlook coming out uh, every June. Uh, and I think we are the only oil and gas company not talking about this is the base case. This is how the, uh, the energy demand is going. This is how much gas demand, oil demand, it's going to be in the world in 2040. We have three different scenarios. And one of those scenarios is a two degree uh, scenario. So uh, I will not talk so much about supply side policies. I think uh, board. Uh, <laughs> talked a lot and very, very well about that. But there's one thing I'd like to mention on, on the supply side policies. Uh, we have, uh, as we've heard, uh, different types of supply side policies in Norway. The one I'd like to mention is the Norwegian CO2 tax, the offshore tax. So for every ton uh, CO2 uh, you emit when you produce oil and gas, you need to pay a tax of uh, around 50 US dollar per ton. This is, as as far as I know, the highest CO2 tax, uh, at least for our, for our business. Uh, this is something we, we have benefited from it in many ways. We have been able to reduce our emissions. This has contributed to us being what we like to call ourselves a worldly, world leader in carbon efficient oil and gas production. And perhaps more importantly, this CO2 tax level in Norway is something that our CEO and the rest of us, I guess, are, are talking about as a good example of how carbon pricing works. So I'm not going to have a kind of explicit view on what the price in the EU ETS should be, but if it could rise from the today levels of, is it four or five euros, to something much higher, and per perhaps something similar we have in Norway as a Norwegian CO2 tax, maybe it would actually be effective. So that's what I want to say about, about one of the supply side policies. I'm sure we'll have discussion on that uh, afterwards. Uh, a few words about our strategic belief. Uh, one of those nice, nice words, our strategic beliefs. So uh, I remember we have, uh, we have the energy perspectives and the different scenarios. There is no doubt that we are in energy transition. There is no doubt that we're moving towards a low emissions future. There is, of course, uncertainty is how fast this will happen. But we're not betting on the business as usual or that it's going to be exactly like it has been over the last 20 years. That would be stupid for a, for a company. So due to, and I'm not, I don't have to tell you, tell you this, uh, but due to policies both on the supply side and the demand side, and perhaps more importantly due to uh, the very fast technological changes we see within renewables, we see within electrification, and I guess the next one uh, um, will be energy storage and the costs coming down for these. We will obviously see a lot of changes going forward. Uh, we, we could see upon this as a threat. Of course, it might be a risk if you want to be in oil and gas forever and if you only want to do oil and gas. Uh, we like to see this as an opportunity. We are in, in renewables and I think... Uh, embracing these changes, look upon them as opportunities, is the right way for, a, for an energy company for us to do, do this. The changes will happen uh, anyway, so it's much better to look at the opportunities of this than to just try high. No, no, it's not happening. It's not happening. That's, that's not how we approach these uh, things. Uh, but for us, it's not oil or gas or renewables. It's, it's about both. Same with the GE. It's... it's it would be probably not a good strategy to only go for one thing in these changing energy markets. So we're talking about both. We see that there will be many new oil and gas productions, fields put in production. We've seen the data from the IA today that in a two degree scenario, uh, current, um, current fields will only produce some 20 to 30 percent of what the demand for oil and gas will be if we should believe IA's two degree scenario. So there will be more oil and gas coming on stream. So that was our strategic beliefs. Um, so then what is, uh, yeah, last thing I wanted to say on, on the oil and gas. So 
Our strategic belief is that, uh, as mentioned, there will be more oil and gas, perhaps not very radical for an oil and gas company to say, but what we do think is that to be among the winners in, within oil and gas, within this low emission future, you would have to be low on cost, probably the most important thing, be low on cost, that's where you, your competitive advantage is. Secondly, you need to be low on CO2 emissions in the production phase, uh, partly because with, with a higher CO2 taxes, a higher CO2 prices, it's going to add to your, to your break even. But and you also need to be low in methane emission. Methane is an issue coming up more and more within the oil and gas business, and that's, that's essential for, for the oil and gas business to reduce and eliminate, el eliminate methane emissions, both in the production but also throughout the value chain. So low on cost, low on carbon, that would be needed. So what is our, our strategy to be among the winners in this changing energy future? First, uh, we want to grow significantly within renewables and new energy solutions. I'll kind of bother with you with, <laughs> you with some, some facts on that. As you may know, we are, we are quite big in, in offshore wind. We are about to serve around 1 million households in the UK and, and Germany by electricity from, from uh, offshore wind. Uh, over the last year, we have invested around 1 billion US dollar in offshore wind. Uh, we are next year in Scotland uh, starting uh, the first offshore floating windmill park and we are putting energy storage next to that one. So we're trying out uh, energy storage technology for, for that one. And uh, you, you may also know that we have launched a, um, a new energy fund, uh, a venture fund, um, 200, million, uh, 200 million US dollar, where we uh, are looking into in, in innovative businesses, companies that are into renewables or into what we call high impact technologies or companies that are doing new business models. So that's, that, that, that fund is obviously not going to do business as usual or things we've done uh, uh, before. Uh, CCS, I'm sure there will be a discussion around that. Always, <laughs> always good to, see, uh, to have CCS. Uh, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Miles, that we have stored more CO2, CO2 than any other company, 20 million ton since we started. Uh, perhaps more interestingly, we're now looking into, together with Norwegian industry, uh, together with uh, Norwegian government, on the possibility of establishing a CCS value chain in Norway. It's very early days, so I can't promise anything, but this is, this is at least something we're looking into. The, the government is coming with a budget in a couple of weeks, so hopefully there will be some money on this. I'm sure you've done lobbying to, to ensure that, uh, what? No? <laughs> so so that's, uh, that will be um, money for, for initiating one to three uh, um, capture plants in, in Norway from Norwegian industry and also for storage of CO2 and this, the role Stato will take on this will be the storage part, helping Norwegian industry to reduce their its CO2 emissions uh, by storing it at the Norwegian continental shelf and hopefully uh, on the long term we may be a storage hub for European industry and power sector as well. This, as I said it's early days but this is at least something we, we are looking into. Um, so what the next thing, I think I've already said it at least once, and we will still be in the oil and gas business, uh, but if we are to be am among the winners, if we are to succeed in that, in what is possibly a shrinking market, uh, we have to be low on cost and we have to be low uh, on carbon. And thirdly, and I think that is and I think, uh, I think uh, GE uh, did a very good uh, presentation on that with, a, with the work you're doing with the Energy Transition Commission. They're very good examples on how different companies, different NGOs and different institutions working together, discussing openly how we can make the world better. Uh, we're not in the Energy Transition Commission, but we are involved in many other initiatives with institutions, with NGOs, with governments. And I think... 
for us to be more efficient, for us to be doing the right things, it's very important for us to have these uh, partnerships. And also, I think the last thing I want to say is the importance of dialogue. Um, we don't have all the answers. Is that the first thing, time you hear an oil and gas company say that? We don't have all the answers. We have to talk with you, we have to talk to all other people, we have to learn. Uh, um, for example, let me give one example on who we're talking a lot to is the, is the Carbon Tracker Initiative. They're doing some great analysis on, on this topic. And really, uh, be challenged, talk to others, get input, do partnerships. That's how we think we will be uh, ready for the low emission future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arne, for your perspectives from the oil industry. And now we will hear from Tina Margrethe Saltvet, which is a chief uh, analyst of uh, the petroleum market in uh, Nordea Bank, which is the largest Nordic bank. So please, Tina. Thank you. I'm probably one of the only um, green oil analysts in Norway, at least. So. Uh, <laughs> Let's start from that starting point. I'm going to talk about three different topics uh, and from a financial side. I'm going to talk about the changing business model for oil companies. Then I thought I'm going to touch, up, uh, touch upon the um, carbon risk transparency. And then at the very end, a bit about the Norwegian oil fund. Not much because I'm not a specialist, but I think it's important to mention because it's very big and it's seeing some wishes from the Norwegian uh, public as well that how could we use this oil fund in a positive way to lead the green shift. We're not there yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's starting to get more focused on what we should invest in for the future. So let's start with the changing business model, because um, there is a risk of stranded assets, of course, if the oil companies are not taking into account the changes in the fundamental which is going on in the oil market at the moment. Because there are big changes, both on the supply and demand side, which will completely change the competitive arena thereon. And of course, climate is one very important uh, topic uh, which the oil companies have to consider when they think about the future investments and not at least also the, uh, the investments and uh, production possibilities. This also accounts for the Norwegian state because um, as an oil producing country you have, to, you have to focus on how many new areas you want to open for future production and of course that will hinge on how you see the market going on uh, in the future. So what are the big changes in the oil market? Well first of all on the um, demand side I think you're going to see rapid changes, much faster than maybe we have discussed so far. Because I think, for example, disruptive technology would, might actually change or moving us in the right direction of a greener, uh, greener um, energy circle than actually the politicians are able to do. Uh, hopefully, both will help us to move to more greener energy. Uh, so that will have an uh, influence on the demand side. What we didn't touch up upon earlier today, and we talked about this rationality of, uh, of uh, oil companies and companies investing in the future. I'm not sure I totally agree about a rational company, because uh, what we have seen so far, when oil prices move up to around $114 in 2014, we saw a lot of oil companies investing in a lot of fields around the world. Why do they actually invest? Because the old business idea was that oil is a scarce resource. So being able to buy up and sit, hold a reserve means that even if it's not profitable today, it will be profitable going forward because it's scarce and the oil demand will continue to uh, increase into the long-term future. This business model, of course, I think is challenged now. First of all, because the rapid changes on the demand side, which I think is very important, but also changes we have seen on the supply side. 
And uh, one thing is the shale oil production because it's so flexible. So we have a bit more flexible production, meaning that the supply curve is starting. Uh, it's very steep, but it's starting to get a bit less steep. But what we haven't discussed is that the supply side in the oil market is very long term, except from the shale oil. Because when you start to invest, it takes approximately seven years until the oil is out in the market, and then you, you produce between 30 and 50 years. Shale is, uh, is different, but it's not that much shale compared to the, the total. What we see on the other side of the balance, you have the supply, but the demand side is much shorter. So it's a mismatch between the changes on the supply and the demand side, because demand changes faster. 55% of the oil we're using goes to trans uh, transport. And since we haven't had much competition within the transportation sector up until now, of course, oil prices could move up for a very long time without seeing much of a reaction to the demand of oil. This, I think, is changing now. First of all, because of the changes in technology, disruptive technology coming into the market, but also because of climate policy. And this will mean that the very steep demand curve in the oil market as well is not going to be that steep any longer because you get much more competition into the market. And what does that mean for the business model of an energy company? Well, it means that the oil, old idea of actually buying up reserves, because you think at some point in the future it will be profitable, is not there any longer. It has to change to management, cost cuts, as we talked about, a complete, completely different way of steering the companies. And I think that not all the oil companies has taken this into account. And the risk is, of course, if you still believe that you should invest in more areas to produce, because the idea that oil demand will continue to rise, uh, the need for oil will continue to rise, then of course the risk is that it will actually sit there with stranded assets in the future. And it's not only all the oil companies who's not taken this into account, also the Norwegian government. Because how long will they continue to open up, for example, new fields or continue with the tax policy they're doing if they don't see that there is a massive change in the oil sector or the oil energy sector as such? So I think that's an uh, important uh, question we're actually discuss, uh, discussing in the Norwegian market at the moment. Um, the second thing I wanted to focus on is that how should we actually make money move faster. And that's uh, what we're discussing a lot in the financial industry now. How should we make money move faster from more high carbon products to less carbon products of greener energy? And one thing I, uh, and that would be a supply side uh, suggestion as well, is to be more transparent about the carbon footprint we see from different companies. So I think we need to be, we need to require more openly or um, more clarify what the footprint will be for different, uh, uh, different uh, companies. Not only in the oil sector, but all companies. And uh, because that will make it easier for investors to know what kind of industry, what kind of company they can invest in uh, to avoid the climate risk. Especially if it's changing the market, it's changing as fast as I think it will do because of the changes in technology and the changes in the requirements for, for in the climate policies. How could we also do this? We could also start to implement uh, carbon risk in our pricing models. Because what we do, what do we do? We price the company or we take the risk of a company uh, and we weight the risk. Today we have market risk, we have financial risk, which is in these, uh, when we credit the company or we, we, give, um, yeah, we credit the company, but then if we start to implement also the credit or the carbon risk into this weighting system, then it would be much more, uh, or then we would take account of the, the carbon risk also when you evaluate a company and then when actually you see the total risk of a company. So we need to get that into the evaluation models, uh, which we're not doing today. 
And it's not only for the oil companies and the um, fossil, uh, fossil fuels companies we have to do this. Because we as a bank, of course, we lend a lot, or we lend a lot of money to oil, gas, uh, not any longer coal industry, but we used to do that as well. Uh, of course, you, when you're go, going to invest in either a bank or a company, a stock, you need to know what you're actually investing in. So I think better exposure or uh, better uh, transparency of the exposure for all companies is very important because I think that will help to move money from high carbon to less carbon investment alternatives. And why am I saying that? Because we already see that many of the clients want to have a green portfolio of two reasons. One, because they want to have, or they're actually told to have a part of green investments in the portfolio. But the second and most important one is that that's where the profitability is increasing. So in that kind of sense, I think it's very important that you do know your carbon risk uh, for the investments you're doing in the future. So at the very end, um, I think uh, I'm going to say a couple of words about the oil fund. It's the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. And I made a bit of calculation to this morning. Um, but it started out in around 1990. Then they decided to build this oil fund. And the purpose of this oil fund is to make a more flexibility in the economy. If oil prices decline, for example, or you have a contraction in the economy, you should, you should be able to use this backup or oil fund to try to stabilize the economy. And so we have done that as well. It's, a, uh, it's actually worked very well. During the financial crisis, of, uh, for example, they started to use a bit more, not of the fund, but the yield of the fund to be able to support the economy in, in uh, uh, periods with, uh, with uh, higher risk. So that's a bit of the idea. So how big is the oil fund and how, uh, how did it start? Well, it started around 1990, they uh, decided to build this oil fund. The first, uh, actually, the, uh, the first uh, transfer of money to the oil fund was in 1996, and then they tra transferred uh, 4.5 billion um, pounds. Now, today, the oil fund, that's 20 years later, how big is the oil fund today? It's around 155 billion uh, pounds. So, of course, this is a massive oil fund. And one of the discussions we have today is, is it possible to use any of this fund to start to invest in more greener energy to help the green shift going on? Uh, today, uh, the purpose of this fund is not to really be used politically. So today they have a sustainability uh, uh, investment profile. So sustainability is very important because it's a long-term fund and they think that sustainability is very important to get profitability out of the fund in the longer term. Uh, the discussion now is about um, could we use this for greener energy? It has been discussed. Uh, actually the oil fund itself want to do that. They apply to actually do that because they think not because they have a political issue doing it, but because they see that in the future, both uh, investing in green energy, but also in infrastructure would be a good investment and also help balancing the fund. And I think it's very uh, important when you see this big, the, the world's biggest sovereign wealth fund is moving in this direction. I think it's a signal to m many other investors as well. And of that reason, I think it's, uh, it will be very interesting discussion. The Ministry of Finance said no, this year they wanted to have a bit more, um, a bit more insight to how this market works, but it will, this discussion will, I promise you, come up again next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, and from the going from the financial market perspectives, we're now going to listen to uh, Ragnil uh, Frengdale, who is going to talk from the local perspective uh, of um, the citizens of Northern Norway. So please, Ragnil, you're uh, a PhD scholar at the Scott Polar Research Institute in, uh, at Cambridge University. Thank you. Um, 
So I will be speaking mainly from a uh, perspective of what is happening in the northern communities of uh, Finnmark in northern Norway, which is where the um, it's the shore of the Barents Sea, where the government uh, currently has um, given away a um, new, li um, new licensing round for developing new petroleum fields. So this is the emerging petroleum pr province of Norway and the future perspectives. And to emphasize the importance of this province to northern Norway, in the Arctic strategy of, um, of Norway, uh, our foreign minister, Berge Brende, has explicitly said that um, the government will target its efforts towards industries which has growth potentials. Uh, the oil and gas sector is a mainstay of economic uh, activity in the north and offers unique opportunities for value creation, employment and growth and for generating other positive spin-off effects in northern Norway. Um, he's also linked this to, um, in the same publication, to melting ice becoming, making or the more accessible Arctic being an opportunity to provide uh, the rest of the world with uh, its need for energy and um, uh, large estimates of oil and gas can create values and that gas can be a transition. So a lot of this rhetoric r runs around the reasoning behind uh, an explicit move towards the Barren Sea. But from a community perspective um, or from the municipalities of the north, it's not immediately clear that what is in the interest of the oil and gas company or of the Norwegian government is actually in the interest of the local communities and that comes a lot down to infrastructure development and jobs. Um, the current oil fields in operation in the Barents Sea are located outside of um, Hammerfest which is a, a city with about 10,000 citizens um, and uh, an oil and gas sector that now employs over a thousand people uh, but which uh, only 10, 15 years ago had a totally different economy. Um, it's also the only part of the um, of the Northern Norway that's seen that kind of growth around uh, the um, around the petroleum resources. Um, but um, to put things a little bit into perspective, uh, Finnmark, which is Northern Norway's northernmost municipal in the region, has 75,000 people living in it, in an area of about 48,000 square kilometers. Uh, when we are talking about the oil industry moving into this area, we're not talking about just extending a cable from Stavanger up to, um, up to the next oil field. We're talking about uh, 1,500 kilometers in air distance between Stavanger and Hammerfest. And we are talking about a place where there is currently very little infrastructure in the electricity net and el where to actually support the kind of growth that is there. Um, Hammerfest has built this up uh, throughout, uh, through an explicit um, political and uh, local economy of will to build up the know-how and the expertise to make that happen. Um, that includes also uh, a... When uh, Hammerfest had a very reliant economy on the fishing industry that was moved out of the, um, partly through regulations in the quotas and um, the moving towards trawlers and partly that a big fillet factory that processed fish and employed by 12, 1300 people at the most was closed. Um, the economy was in crisis until they then got the oil as their uh, development possibility. Um, however, there is no guarantee for other communities that they will have the same thing. One of the main reasons why Hammerfest managed to secure their um, part of the cake on the, on the development of uh, Snow White, which is a gas field with an onshore processing LNG run by Statoil, um, was that uh, the oil comes on shore, or the gas comes on shore to um, to the processing plant and so they have both a stable amount of local jobs and income through the property tax. They've invested a lot of money in infrastructure, building schools and making the city see that they also benefit from the oil industry. Um, when there was a, um, there is also an oil field in operation called Goliath, uh, which is run by the Italian oil company Eni. Uh, when that was uh, decided upon, 
there were several options for where the oil should be brought on shore, and many of the neighbouring municipalities were trying to secure their part of this because they looked at Hammerfest and said, and thought that if they secure themselves with another, um, with the onshore processing, that means that they will have local jobs, they'll have a boost to the economy. Um, the political process ended with the oil field being an offshore um, field exclusively, with ships going um, to the plant, to the to the oil field. Um, any placed their offices in Hammerfest as well as a way of ensuring there would be some regional growth. Um, and there has been a lot of deliveries also from the local supply chain. But for the neighbouring municipalities, there is very little effect. There is an emergency oil spill response depot and someone who, who maintains that. There's a couple of oil spill response exercises every year. There's some boats that have gone into the fishing fleet in a cooperation with the uh, government authorities and company and local actors. But overall, the effect remains fairly small. Um, in another municipality not far away, Statoil have just um, made an investment decision to not do an onshore processing terminal, but also do an offshore development of the Kastberg field which is significantly larger, but still still not uh, large enough for them to see the economy in taking it on shore. And so for, for the municipality, there is now less guarantee of the local um, development than there would be. Um, another uh, issue with, so these are, just, these are just the projects that are currently on stream and are happening and are made investment decisions about them. Um, then for further down the line, if there, if there is an argument for this operating in a low-cost, low-carbon environment, it's very unlikely for the communities that they will actually manage to secure that oil on shore, unless there is a massive political uh, will to make that happen. But in a world where we see that there are risks to, to the oil companies and to the future of the Barents Sea, it's also not really sure that this will keep developing. And uh, Final note on the infrastructure is also that, um, as I said in the beginning, um, there is uh, a uh, insecurity towards whether um, this will, what this means for local communities. Uh, but if you build uh, oil uh, fields, particularly with the demands that the Norwegian um, governments tend to have about electrification uh, from onshore rather than using gas and self-powering the stations. Um, there is also a need to build new electricity grids, and that is paid for uh, probably by the government, but also by the primary, primary resource users in the area, particularly the reindeer herders who will have the power lines going through their grazing areas. So there are a lot of issues that are thrown up, not just specifically relating to climate change, but also in terms of the just transition and who is actually benefiting and not from this development. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the panelists. And uh, I think we have about 20 minutes for a discussion now. So I uh, will open up for uh, questions from the audience. So we have one there. You're one and you're two and you're three. Thank you for all those presentations. Uh, and I'm glad to see that uh, Statoil was an early leader in recognizing climate change and climate science. So thank you for that leadership, Arna, and, and others. Uh, my question for you, Arna, is um, you, you say you fully support the Paris Agreement, and I'm wondering what kind of assessments you're doing in order to assure that that is happening. Uh, and when you expect peak oil and gas production to happen, if that's being modeled, and if there is a conflict between the investments in additional oil and gas development in Norway as well as internationally in terms of um, increasing production in Norway and elsewhere versus reducing total oil and gas production. Uh, and one quick question to board also about the petroleum-free zones. Uh, is the idea to also exclude horizontal drilling under the petroleum-free zones? or is it only surface 
activities we're talking about. Oh, and my name is Richard Hebe with Climate Accountability Institute. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great if you can introduce yourselves. So. Hi, I'm Megan Darby from Climate Home. Um, I also have a question for Arne. Uh, we heard yesterday Paul Eakins um, presenting his unburnable carbon analysis, and one of the things he said was, if any country doesn't need to uh, produce its fossil fuels, it's Norway. Um, uh, so I'd like to get your response to that. Um, and also, um, NGOs making this point rather more forcefully. I understand they're planning um, a legal action against the government, saying that the, you know, the government should not be putting these Arctic uh, blocks uh, up for licence. Um, and I'm kind of interested in anybody's comment, on the panel's comments on, on that. There was one here on the front. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think I was accused of bringing down the government, which is a, a first for an academic. But in, in self-defense, um, this, I, I can't resist advertising as well. This paper, um, which uh, I put some copies outside, it's the case for mandatory sequestration, but it was actually published after that incident, uh, so you can't, you can't blame me. But I, I do hope we get third time lucky um, with CCS in Norway, because I, I, we can't really afford to mess this one up again. I mean, the UK has failed twice now, maybe more than twice, and has probably given up. So this may be CCS's last chance. And, and the crucial um, point of this paper was we need a, uh, a, a business case for CCS which doesn't depend on mandating it at the point of emission. Because if you do that, you the government falls, because um, you, you end up, and, and, and you end up with the sort of clean power plan arguments that are, that are happening in the US, where people present CCS as a war on coal, or as it was presented in, 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 in that argument in Norway, as, as a sort of war on natural uh, gas ex exploitation entirely. Um, so what we propose, there's copies of the paper outside, you need a, you need a mandated in gradually. So, so uh, fossil fuel extractors eventually will have to put away the same amount of CO2 that they extract. We all know that, that's what net zero means. We just need to get on a path where we increase the sequestered fraction progressively rather than in a panic in the 2040s. And this is something Norway has the opportunity to do. Norway could demonstrate to the world that it's possible to have a progressive fossil fuel extraction policy that is consistent with a net zero 1.5 degree world. And if Norway could demonstrate that to the world, you would then turn around to the rest of the world and, and, and indeed to Paul Eakins and say, look, Norway is showing the world it's possible to extract fossil fuels responsibly. And that would be a fantastic service. Um, much better than just turning around and saying to the world, look, Norway is so nice, they're leaving their fossil fuels in the ground, which is something you can't expect the rest of the world to do. So um, I'm hoping for reactions from all of the panel on that. So thanks for that. I think we have, we'll have now a round of answers, and then we'll take some more questions afterwards. Yes. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so how do we, uh, as mentioned, we fully support the Paris Agreement and how do we make sure that we are actually follow that in practice, in our investment decisions? So uh, we have, uh, we, we tend to see uh, the Paris Agreement and the ambitions in the Paris Agreement uh, in terms of a carbon budget like many of you are doing. I think that's a very useful way of, of looking upon this. When you're discussing uh, the carbon budget, it can be seen from a kind of a, uh, how much you as a company can morally produce of the, the total budget, and or, sorry, uh, and or it could be seen from a perspective where uh, only the most cost efficient, profitable uh, projects will, will go on, which is the latter, it's more the, the carbon tracker perspective. I find most, uh, or both of them are very interesting. Uh, if you look at our reserves, uh, we will have, we have enough reserves to produce for around eight more, more years, proven reserves. Uh, whereas, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, Venezuela and Canada, as we've seen earlier today, they would have, have reserves for, for many, many decades. So 
it's not so that uh, Statoil as a company will kind of uh, overshoot the, the carbon budget uh, by ourselves. So that's kind of a, uh, call it a moral uh, calculations. But I think this is a kind of a theoretical way of looking at it. I think in a, in a low carbon future, when the Paris Agreement is implemented, that might hit on, on the, the demand for oil and gas, which again might hit the prices. So it will be those being able to produce most carbon and cost efficient that would be within that uh, uh, budget. And what do we do with that? That's, we are doing uh, a portfolio resilience of our, our portfolio. So in our last sustainability report, we, we assessed how much a two degree scenario would impact on the net present value of our portfolio and we found it that it will be some five percent lower than it would be in a, in a new policy scenario and i think this is exactly the kind of information the, invest, the investors and banks uh, would need to have and this is something we we welcome as well more climate and carbon transparency um, I think this discussion on who is, whether Norway or others should, uh, should uh, produce the oil and gas, uh, it's probably better to ask the Norwegian government about, about their view on that. But, but I think uh, it's, who, if we are to have that kind of uh, division, how, how would we do that in practice? How could we agree on the UN level now it's your turn to produce and not, not your turn because you have so much money and you have produced for so many years so you better stop now, it's, it's another country. It's, it's challenging and, uh, and that's why I think we will still see most policies on the, on the, on the demand side. It will be really uh, emission performance standards for car, it will be development, uh, technological developments who really will decide the demand for oil and gas and who would who would be able to produce and if you have only high cost uh, barrels you would probably lose that competition and that's that's i guess how how it is and it remains to be seen how good we we will be in norway on that going forward so uh, that would be my answer to that one uh, i completely agree with you on the ccs third time lucky um we will do our best what i want to say there is that we we look upon this as, as, as an opportunity, but we also need to make some money on it. So it's a public partnership thing. We're not saying that we need to extremely high re uh, rate of return, but we won't do this unless we see uh, a good also economical reason for doing it. So we need some short answers too, to uh, have a, a new <laughs> round of questions afterwards. So short answer first to, uh, uh, Richard on the petroleum free zones. Um, well, so so the idea that has been put forward is that all um, all types of uh, oil and gas activity, whether exploration or uh, production, should be uh, should be banned, including um, the horizontal drilling. So the horizontal drilling is, is uh, well, I guess it mostly something that has been discussed uh, with regards to the uh, potential opening of the areas outside of the Lofoten Islands, where the continental shelf is very. It's very narrow, so the distance to uh, to land is uh, is not very long, and you can do this potentially do this horizontal uh, drilling, and then have the production uh, facilities onshore. What that would mean, though, is that uh, while it would uh, decrease the risk of of um, uh, of uh, oil spills uh, in relation to the production facility, it would also mean that all the transport would have to go, you know, into <laughs> Uh, in, into the to the shoreline and and uh, and so the risk uh, related to transport would uh, would increase um, and uh, for the uh, for the fishery uh, fisheries communities who also oppose uh, opening these areas to oil and gas uh, exploration the whole exploration phase and especially the this uh, seismic um, uh, exploration is, is also an extremely important part of why they why they oppose it. So uh, so it's not really something that has been you know within the policy discussion has has uh, contributed to, contributed to to um, you know a lot of progress on that on on that issue. 
Uh, on the lawsuit, very quickly, yes, uh, there are environmental NGOs considering lawsuit, not, not specifically in relation to Arctic activity, but in order to uh, challenge the new lic licensing round that has been announced by the by the government to award new new licenses on the Norwegian con continental shelf uh, generally. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will will go forward. There has been some talk about this for uh, for a few years. The, the lawsuit is uh, based on um, a constitutional uh, uh, clause uh, about uh, the government's responsibility to protect the environment for future generations, and it's very unusual in the Norwegian context to to um, to uh, bring a case to the court on the basis of uh, of a constitutional uh, claim. So because that's really not part of the the uh, legal tradition in a way, but it remains to be seen how uh, how that will move forward. And then finally, just a quick comment on the mandatory sequestration. I, I think we can agree that you're off the hook with regards to the government resigning in 2000. Uh, but I do think that the, the Norwegian case is interesting, uh, even though it's not directly, I mean, it's related to to the use of, of gas rather than the production, but, but um, so because the Norwegian environmental NGO community has differed uh, somewhat from NGOs elsewhere in that they've taken a fairly pragmatic view on, on CCS for, for quite some time and they have consistently ever since the late 90s been arguing for mandatory sequestration if you will either you know there's been some kind of constructive ambiguity there because for parts of the environmental movement that has been about uh, about you know um, preventing the building of power plants altogether because it would decrease the chances of, of them being built or and part, for other parts it has been about wanting to develop uh, CCS but, but either way the consistent message has been you know either you do CCS or you don't build it uh, and uh, while that had some uh, traction um, as long as there were um, well, let's say more regular energy companies wanting to build uh, isolated power plants. Uh, as soon as, well, Stockholm, <laughs> the oil industry, uh, ha you know, had interests in, in building that, uh, then the the gains that were achieved on, on regulation, political regulation, were were very quickly lost. So I think it's really a lesson in, in you know the whole uh, political economy uh, economy around that, and and uh, a cautionary tale that, that it might not really be a very um, uh, necessar not necessarily be a very effective, uh, uh, you know, strategy for uh, for environmental uh, the environmental movement. But that's maybe a bigger discussion. So I think we're going to have some uh, a round of questions now, and then I will give Rami and uh, Tina the uh, the microphone. So there was one in white T-shirt over there, and in the red T-shirt there, and in the green uh, up there. And you in the striped or patterned. <laughs> well, I thank you, friends. Um, support running from Canada. I, I'm trying to understand the regulatory environment so I can understand comparisons. Um, and I'm a little bit confused. So there's a, but there was a lot of numbers there on the taxes. So you mentioned, um, Arnie, that there's a $50 carbon tax. Um, and uh, a ton. So uh, is that a hundred percent coverage? And are there competitiveness measures there um, that uh, reduce that overall cost uh, to to production? And um, is there any limit on emissions? Is there any cap on emissions or on production now? And finally, when new fields or projects are assessed. For national interest determination, are they assessed with a business as usual market scenario? Is there any work uh, by the government done to assess uh, for a two degree or a 1.5 global market economic scenario? And then just to Arne on, on your, you said Stat Oil is focusing on low cost, low CO2 development, and yet you're investing in the oil sands and in the Arctic. So I'm wondering how you can square that circle for me. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, Farland, you didn't want to go? Have you passed? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, Steve Kretzman from Oil Change International. Um, quick question on you said, um, Arnett, that uh, you use a two degree forecast 
Um, just wondering, uh, is that a 50% chance of two degrees? It looks so from what I'm seeing. And if so, given that the upper limit of what the Paris Agreement is is two degrees, shouldn't we be aiming for a likely scenario of two degrees? And what would that mean? How do you model that? Then it was down here with the... Um, Hi, Sheila Whitley with the Overseas Development Institute. I was really excited to hear that the IEA is looking at this question of state-owned enterprise, the role of state-owned enterprise in um, the low-carbon transition, particularly because from estimates that I've seen, 70% of oil, gas, and coal production, including fossil fuel power, power is state-owned. And they, it's really a topic that's significantly overlooked. Obviously, the divestment movement touches on some of that, where these state-owned enterprises are publicly listed, but it's a real Whole and we look at um, state owned enterprise investment in terms of the G20, it's, it's $244 billion a year in fossil fuel production. So, what I'm wondering is um, if we're thinking more optimistically, what could be the role of state owned enterprise in the transition? And do you see potentially state owned enterprises having an advantage um, in the transition and navigating the transition because of the ability to work with governments on kind of longer, louder signals? Mm. Um, and I think Norway is a really interesting example because you have both a production company, but also a power company in Statcraft. Mm. So interesting to see what discussions you're having around that as well. So then, uh, Tina, would you start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, by, um, can you come? I have this one. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I can start the same as the uh, government or the uh, Ministry of uh, Oil and Energy has, they, they're making this kind of scenario analysis. Of course, because Norway is part of the Paris Agreement as well, they, they do make this analysis with a two degree scenario. But I still think the uh, difficulty is that when you're actually going to put this out in operation, it's more difficult because the politicians are just sitting there for four years. And I'm not sure from it actually works from paper till, uh, till real life. Because as I talked about, you know, you have to look at the business model in a completely new way. And I'm not sure if actually the politicians really want to take this into account yet, because it's a, an election next year. Um, the oil industry is quite powerful. It has accounted for a lot of, uh, of investments you know, for the, the, the economy and also uh, for a lot of workers. So in that kind of sense, I think you know, it's not necessarily the companies, but it's also the politicians who are afraid to do that decision. Of course, it's a hash position, but uh, otherwise we might get, uh, end up with stranded assets because um, because uh, then it's no doubt that Norway have, doesn't have the cheapest oil to produce in the world. But the government produces the analysis and yeah. it's available, publicly available. Not on a field by field basis, though, uh, right? I mean, on, on, on a field by field basis, the decision is made based on. You know, whether it's deemed commercial, commercially, yeah. deemed commercially viable, then it's it's uh, okay, so uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so it's so it's up, so basically for each for each uh, um, for decisions uh, uh, you know for developing each field, that's a decision. Um, the the risk there is is assessed by the companies basically, and uh, and um, the what the government says is that. Well, we have a taxation system that will ensure that if it's deemed commercially viable, then it will be also, uh, you know, uh, socio-economically uh, beneficial. So uh, they don't do any, even though they do long-term uh, analysis, as they say, they don't do it on a field-by-field like, uh, -field basis. I think they had one report once the, where they did it for field-by-field -field basis as well a couple of years ago. Okay. This is also where um, there's a lack in the impact assessments of how uh, what will happen when we open up the new, I mean, in the new, um, in the, when you say the reasoning behind the new licensing round, there is hardly any discussion of climate change at all. If there is any discussion of climate change, it is about, more about the ice edge having moved further north and therefore more areas are accessible from which to extract oil. So there's very little, little actual acknowledgement of climate change impacting the regional oil production. So I think we're going to give... Uh, and, and if I can also add, there, there was also a, um, by the uh, local um, um, business actors and uh, municipal people that in 2013 in, the, in Finnmark, um, they, they had four wild cards that might influence, so that they had kind of development scenarios where all four of them included uh, some level of petroleum development and varying degrees of uh, local involvement. 
in, in none of that they had four wild cards, including um, a, an atom bomb making Finnmark uninhabitable and um, um, international regulations making uh, petroleum extraction in northern Norway impossible. And that was a wild card and not something they actually considered in any of the scenarios three years ago. So there is kind of, yeah. So we're going to give Arne a chance to uh, answer yeah. very in shortly. Fact, one early, one minute. 30 seconds. 30 30 seconds. Seconds. Oil Sun Arctic, we are involved in a very tiny oil sand project. We have no plans to do more on oil sands. On Arctic, we will not uh, invest in projects if they are too costly. So it has to be low on, on cost. And also we have requirements when it comes to carbon intensity for the, those. Uh, on um, two degree forecast, uh, so what we're doing is basically we take the IEA forecast and uh, to my understanding that's the 50% of, of Chile. If IEA, or maybe we should say when IEA, uh, go into 1.5 degree forecast, we would need to, to look into that. But uh, I can tell you, I can't tell you now whether we will, will change or not. Um, advantage of uh, state-owned enterprises, clearly. Uh, what I learned yesterday is the big difference between uh, state-owned companies, uh, obviously, I mean, uh, in terms of governance, uh, China would be different from Norway, and it's also, of course, whether you are 100% state-owned or 66% state-owned, but I think that you have the ability to kind of perhaps think a little bit more long-term as a state-owned company, and, but I'm happy to discuss that more with you. So, yes, thank you very much.